This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. U.S. Ambassador to Israel David Friedman told The New York Times Israel has the right to annex parts of the West Bank. In April, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu made a campaign promise to annex the territory. Before becoming ambassador, the U.S. ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, worked as Trump's bankruptcy lawyer. He had no diplomatic experience. This comes as the Trump administration is preparing to release Jared Kushner's Middle East peace plan at a conference in Bahrain that begins on June 25th. The Palestinian leadership has vowed to boycott the talks. We continue our conversation today with pioneering Israeli attorney Leit Semel who's profiled in the new documentary, Advocate, which chronicles how Leit Semel has spent the last 50 years defending Palestinians who resist the Israeli occupation. Also with us, the film's director, Rachel Leah Jones. Um, the film has been premiering in film festivals. I just saw it here in New York. It was the opening night of the Human Rights Watch Film Festival at Lincoln Center. Congratulations. Uh, both you, Leah, and Rachel Thanks. Leah Jones were there. Um, and it premiered in Israel in the Dhaka Aviv Film Festival documentary, Tel Aviv. Um, we started talking about that in part one of our conversation. Yeah. But it won the highest prize. Mm -hmm. We won first prize, which was a surprise, uh, a lovely one. Um, you know, we premiered at Sundance and then went through a bunch of festivals until we showed in Tel Aviv. I think, for me, Tel Aviv was the premiere. We needed to know how it was going to be received on home turf, and it was received beyond our wildest expectations. The general feeling that we had was that, given the kind of uh, chilling effect that the last four years have had on Israeli Jews— I mean, Israel's always had a big human rights problem and now also has a civil rights rights problem, or the abutting civil rights problem, meaning Israeli Jews have come to feel uncomfortable being having your cake and eating it, too, being anti-occupation and living a perfectly fine life. And so there was a chilling effect that came into place. I felt affected by it in the last four years, and, uh, and it felt a little bit like uh, the audience, 1,800 people in five sold-out screenings over the course of one week, were saying, you know what, if this is the new normal, we're pushing back a little bit. We're going to reclaim some space that feels like these narratives also represent us. And Leah represents them. Strangely enough, the least representative Israeli out there, so many people felt such deep identification. You know, Leah's one of those people who spoke truth to power before the term became trendy, and she's one of the people who will continue to do so after fear makes it unfashionable. At the Human Rights Watch Film Festival, you talked about her being the woman uh, that people, that Israelis love to hate. And hate to and love. Hate to love, yeah. Um, she's very personable. In part one of the show, she said, you know, yeah, we all started as revolutionaries and with big highfalutin ideas, but ultimately I was faced with a choice. Do I go with my nationality or with my humanity? And I chose my humanity. And I think that's what's coming across for people. Um, and that's what comes across in the courthouse, uh, inside the courtroom, in the hallways. She's a flirt. She's naughty. She's playful. She's serious. She's a fighter. She's on. She tells everybody what they th what she thinks of what they're doing, and after that, it's how are you doing? How's your wife? You know, there's a kind of a, per a personable way that she deals. Even the bad guys are humans, and she deals with everybody um, on that on that level. We we observed it while we were filming, and clearly, people love to hate her, but they also hate to love her. One judge is um, sub uh, from another project, a fantastic film. If people are interested in this topic, called "The Law in These Parts" by Ranan Alexandrovich. Cool. The Law in These Parts. It won Sunday seven years ago. Um, in some ways, it's a precursor to our film, because it, um, it sort of maps out the history of the Israeli uh, military legal system. And in one of his interviews there, he told us this when we were getting started on our film, a judge, a very high-ranking judge, uh, said, if Leah Samuel didn't exist, we would have to invent her. Um, because she plays this really tricky um, role for Israelis. On the one hand, she's the boy pointing um, at the emperor, calling him nude, and saying, you know, the, the system doesn't work work. She's calling out the most fundamental flaw of the system, which is saying the occupied, uh, the occupier is judging the occupied. Um, how, how could that possibly work? And she's constantly reminding the judges of that. Are you really in a position to judge what this, what this person did? And can you see that his individuality? The other thing that she's doing, though, she's also the, the boy with his finger in the dam, right, trying to keep the flood of injustice from drowning all of us. And I think that Israeli Jews today are understanding her 
her role in keeping her finger in the dam, which is also something that has saved their humanity over the years. Mm. So, Rachel Leah Jones, talk about the cases of Leah Semmels that you chose to focus on. The film follows uh, one primary case in real time, the case of a 13-year-old boy who went out with his 15-year-old cousin on um, a stabbing spree or ran around with knives. It's not 100 percent clear what their intentions were. They had very little time to premeditate over it. They came home from school, threw their backpacks in the corner, grabbed knives, the 13-year-old under the influence of the 15-year-old, and ran out to the nearby settlement. What they had discussed among themselves was, we're going to scare the Jews. We want to scare them so they stop killing us. Um, what happened in practice is, Two people were stabbed, not killed, a 13-year-old uh, Jewish boy and a 20, 21-year-old Jewish man. And the 15-year-old cousin was the stabber, because the 13-year-old's knife was clean. Um, there were no, no, no evidence, no DNA findings on it. And, um, and the 15-year-old was eliminated, that's, as the Israelis call it, assassinated on site. But somebody still had to stand trial for this, because the public needs a trial. So even if he had faced the, probably the harshest punishment anybody could face, which is execution on site, somebody had to pay in terms of the Israeli public. And the 13-year-old was accused of two attempted murders. And therein starts a whole saga about how Leah should handle that kind of a case. So, Leah Tzemel, we'll talk about taking yes. this case on. I mean, the journey you go on with this boy's family. Um, Talk about why you took the case and what it meant to you and what happened I with it. I took the case as one of a series of very similar cases of youngsters who take upon themselves the continuation of the Palestinian struggle. <clears throat> In this particular case, he was very, very young. And there was a, a conflict whether uh, we should grab an immediate uh, plea bargain to plead guilty for the two attempted murders, although he, murders, although he denies it totally, denies any intention to kill anyone, any feelings, any mens rea of of, uh, of um, murder in him, uh, but to grab it and try to sentence him before he becomes 14, and by that he would avoid prison. Um, Together with the family, we decided not to, because he does not plead guilty to attempted murder. It's against the interrogation, it's against his uh, values, it's against whatever he represents, although he was hardly tortured, and we can see it in the movie. I mean, this is amazing, the video footage you have. Um, I have to say, it reminded me, uh, in New York, of the case of the Central Park jogger, five boys. They're the yeah. same age. I mean, I think yeah. in your case, it was 13. These boys are 14 years old. And um, and in police interrogation, they're being screamed at. And um, you, Rachel, had access to this video footage, yeah. and it was played in court um, as the Israeli interrogators are screaming at this boy. Not only boy. are they screaming, they— bluff him. They tell him that they have a video of him stabbing the people. And he says, I don't, I don't remember. I don't remember, because exist, he didn't but, stab. But they insist, we saw you, we are mm -hmm. seeing you, you are there, you did it. And he doesn't know what to say, you know. He says, I don't remember. And he really had a brain... Um, um, his skull was broken, because they called a, a car to run over him in order to stop to arrest him. And... Uh, Really, a small boy being faced with lies and having to react to it, it was unbearable. I think that, that one of the main reasons that we followed this case were because Leah starts out as a sister to her client, and then over the years sort of becomes their mother. Along comes a 13-year-old, and suddenly she's her client's grandmother. And uh, if the first clients uh, kind of have an approach uh, to whatever they're doing, uh, which is another world is possible, the kid comes along and tells us the world that we have bequeathed to him is impossible. And she feels implicated by that, presumably, um, along with everyone else, because why should 13-year-olds be trying to handle uh, 
anything about this historical mess that we, you know, that that, that he's born and raised and, into. Yeah. Um, and and I so so I, although she's very devoted to all of her clients, I think that this one really hits her uh, in another place. Another reason it hits her uh, hard is because um, he stands up uh, to his uh, interrogators uh, or stands up to the process of interrogation, sta you know, uh, withstands it rather uh, in a way that almost none of her adult clients manage to. So there's just something so utterly pure about his insistence that he really um, didn't have criminal intent or, th or the kind of criminal intent that he's that is being attributed to him. Um, and Leah wants justice. Uh, it's, al it's almost impossible to come by in uh, almost all of her cases. And here um, she felt like it was really maybe doable, which she says in the film, I start every case thinking maybe this time I'm going to manage. Um, I don't think she could play the game otherwise. Does she know that it's a completely unlevel playing field and the chances are, are, are like this, you know, that, the, that, if, that if Israel has a 96 percent or 98 percent conviction rate with Palestinian um, defendants, it's going to be something like 99.9. She knows that. But she has to work on that sliver. She has to work on that sliver of possibility among other reasons, because she also believes in the humanity of the people she's up against. The prosecutors, the interrogators, the judges are people, and maybe she can get them to see beyond the terrorist. So talk about meeting with the family and being there for them, explaining the system to them. Yeah, uh, it's enormous responsibility to take such a case that could perhaps end up differently and um, decide to go to the end with the, um, all the, possi the bad possibilities that are waiting there. So the family had to agree, and uh, you can also s see some footage in the film that we talk it with the family, and the family and the child say, no, I d had no intention of killing anyone, so I'll not plead guilty for that, although I'm offered some candies if I do. Uh, we continued. It, it was a very bad um, consequence in the first degree in the district court, and later on uh, the punishment was mitigated a bit in the Supreme Court. But still he would not uh, be released un until he's 23 years old. And uh, He's a 13-year-old boy. Yeah, a 13-year-old boy. He will grow up in prison. This is the reality. And uh, from time to time we visit him, we see that he studies, he's maintaining all right, more or less, with other youngsters his age, and now they become even uh, I mean, younger and younger. The figures on this, mm -hmm. what, 800,000 Palestinians have been arrested. Exactly. 40% yeah. of the male population of the occupied territories has been arrested. Almost yeah. half the population. Yeah. Yes, of it, course, of course. It's yeah. a daily event for Palestinians. It, it's a people <laughs> criminalized and incarcerated en masse. And I use those terms because they're not the ones that we commonly get, get um, kind of um, circulated when you think about Israel-Palestine. Maybe they resonate more with um, U.S. audience in, in terms of criminal justice reform and, and so on. But I think it's really important. And in the beginning of the film, when Leah says to a talk show host 20 years ago, you should uh, try to listen to what I'm telling you, because they're sort of, she says, I'll never understand you, I can't possibly understand, but that's okay, right? And Leah says, well, you maybe you should, because I'm the future. And when she says I'm the future, what she means is, if the people that we're sharing this piece of land with are criminalized and incarcerated en masse like that. And I know what they've been through because basically every, I know I being Leah, basically every Palestinian defendant has been tortured one way or another in varying degrees, anywhere on the scale from one to ten, but in varying degrees. It is with these people and with those experiences with whom we're going to have to share our futures. And I know what that entails. You might want to listen to what I have to say, because security jurisprudence um, is, uh, is not solving anything. If anything, it's uh, making things There's worse. There's a 99 percent conviction rate? Uh, more or less, yeah. Yes. <laughs> you call yourself the losing lawyer. Sometimes, <laughs> yes, that's a basic And you practice feeling. on, and this was pointed <clears throat> out um, yesterday at the Human Rights Watch Film Festival and the talk back afterwards. Talk about where the courthouse is. 
Well, there are few. There are few courts, of course. First of all, we have courts all over the, the uh, occupied territories. We used even to have a court in Gaza, of course, that I I used to go once a week at least, and uh, all over the West Bank. Now they concentrated it to to two major courts on the borderline, and of course there are courts all over Israel. There is a total separation between the settlers who live in the same occupied territories and act very often against the same soldiers and separation between them and their legal uh, procedures in Israeli proper courts, civil courts, and the Palestinians who will be brought from the same territory, same similar actions, they would be brought to a military court. And uh, still there are courts in Israel, and the court that we are seeing in the movie, again and again, is the District Court of Jerusalem, which is based on Salah Adin Street in the occupied uh, East Jerusalem, just vis-à-vis -vis the Ministry of Justice that is also occupying uh, another building of the uh, former uh, Jordanian regime. And that's where the sceneries are, not far from my office. And um, this is our reality for the last so many years. Rachel A. Jones, you do uh, something interesting, many interesting things in the documentary, but one of it, one of the things are the illustrations. Explain how you animate this film. We were faced with um, a structural limitation. We, you know, there is, there, as in, um, as in most countries, there's, there's, there are special laws pertaining to, to, to the, to the, to the prosecution of, of minors, and to minors in legal proceedings. And um, anonymity, both you know, face and name, are part of those expectations that youth, that youth can be rehabilitated, and therefore they shouldn't um, go be known in the world publicly as sort of criminal loss causes, right? And so the youth law mandates that. Um, but that the anonymity be um, be preserved. Uh, Israeli media, Palestinian media, and international media violated that um, law left and right. Um, that didn't make it uh, possible for us to necessarily violate that law. The law still stands, so we were obliged to um, obscure his identity and his name. But we also felt. Um, that it was a necessity, that it was a moral imperative. You take a legal system that has, and I think Leah is the exemplar of this, you take a legal system that has enormous flaws, but you don't necessarily want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You say some of these structures have the potential to be applied in ways that are progressive. Maybe we don't let go of all of them. So we decided to sort of be holier than the Pope on this and to uh, uh, obscure his name and obscure his likeness. However, we, we were, yeah, we were faced with, uh, with a possibility of doing so with what? Uh, blurring, pixelation, that would mean also sort of taking away his humanity. That would mean um, um, effacing him effectively. And I had no interest, nor did my partner on the project, Philippe Leish, any interest in effacing him or dehumanizing him. So there was nothing in that law that said you can't, you, you, that obscuring entailed dehumanizing or effacing. So we took it to the other extreme and we created an animated effect that preserved humanity but obscured the identity. So you yeah, we, so we illustrated it with um, with um, with uh, artifacts basically from Leah's desk if you will laws charge sheets uh, decisions uh, press clippings 50 years worth of uh, of, of visual and f material culture around litigating the occupation that are applied uh, uh, to to the characters uh, in a way, they start to wear the weight of history. You understand that, they're, that they are historical constructs, that a woman who wakes up in the morning does X, or a boy who comes home from school and does Y, are not doing so out of history, out of context, that there's a political story here that they have been cast into. And explain the case of the woman. Um, a minor, more minor uh, secondary case that we follow is the case of a woman named Isra Jabis, a 31-year-old mother of an 8-year-old who, um, who um, her car 
Uh, it's hard to speak at. My understanding is she sets her car on fire at a checkpoint. Um, as Leah says in the film. With herself in it. With herself in it. Uh, lightly injures a policeman, an Israeli policeman, and um, burns herself. Maybe 60 percent of her body is burned. So mutilates herself effectively. As Leah says in the film, was it a suicide bombing? Was it a suicide bombing? One thing is clear the woman didn't want to stay alive. Suicide by cop, for sure. Okay, something along those lines. Uh, but she survives and she's in prison. She's sentenced to, um, to 11 years. The boy is sentenced to 12. And they were sentenced on the same day back to back, which we couldn't have known in advance. We could only yeah. thank, uh, thank our lucky stars that we were following both because both sentences somehow become part and parcel of the same um, collapse of, uh, uh, as Leah says in the film, um, I fear that um, the expectation that Palestinians can find justice in the Israeli legal system may have been buried today for good. Oh. We don't know if that's indeed the case, um, but that's how she feels on that particular day. Mm. How did you survive that day? Uh, you know, just yet another day illustrating the 99 percent uh. conviction rate in Israeli courts of Palestinians. I thought that we have to appeal and put all our energy into the appeal, and perhaps we, we won partly only the case of the boy. But uh, that's how I could pull myself in my, with my own Me hair out of this uh, dam. Meanwhile, you're working with a Palestinian lawyer named yes. Tarek Bagut. Yes. Can you explain what happens with Tarek? It seems we only revealed it much later, just recently, when this he was detained three months ago uh, by the Israeli security services, that um, that case really uh, broke for him the ability to continue his work as a lawyer and seeking for justice in the Israeli courts. And uh, here and there, during those uh, the two and a half years that passed since that day, he um, um, shot at Israeli uh, targets in the occupied territories, uh, some um, roadblock, and then uh, buses of settlers. Nothing happened, really. Nobody was injured, but that's how I understand he... Um, could live together with his one failing profession on one hand and his life as a Palestinian patriot. So he is now charged with... He is now charged with shooting at places where people could be, uh, according to the defense regulation and according to the military uh, law in the occupied territories, military orders. And your orders. colleague has now become your client. Yeah, and of course, he's naturally also my client. And there are many other lawyers who are supporting him and us uh, in this case. And he's waiting um, some years in prison, yeah, of course. Trial and— How many years in prison does he face? More than 10, I believe. And how has the Great March of Return that happens every Friday, people nonviolently protesting in Gaza, yet um, hundreds of them shot by uh, Israeli uh, military snipers, thousands injured, um, hundreds killed, how has this affected life in Israel? We should see the real picture. The real picture is that this enormous refugee camp, Gaza, has refugees from all over that area exactly surrounding Gaza. It was, it was Ashkelon, Ashdod, and all the places around it, Beersheba. And those people want to return, and they want their freedom, and they want their uh, democracy, and they want their self-rule not being ruled by Israel as it, the situation is now. And although Israel withdrew from Gaza, it still controls it and controls the sea, as we, we saw, and the fishermen's uh, possibility to, to make live, a living. And uh, they come in uh, only demonstration. They have nothing but stones or balloons in their hands. 
and uh, Israel treats them as uh, they used to treat recently, and more and more so, shooting in order to kill. Paramedics, journalists, yeah. children. Exactly. So uh, that's what we are living in. Do you feel the Israeli peace movement has any effect? <sighs> Is there an Israeli peace movement? We are going with this movie all, o all over the world, in different um, um, countries. We came here to the Human Rights, uh, uh, Human Rights Watch, and we, we were in other festivals uh, in Europe. You did the and Krakow we, Film Festival, where this, yeah. where Advocate won first prize, right. the Saloniki Film uh, Festival won again, first prize, again, and the first of course, prize, et cetera. And when we talk to the people, we believe that they would wake up somehow, and uh, if they're not, I believe many of them know the reality, but they will be recruited into some kind of a reaction. And we have to react. We don't react enough. Final comments, Rachel A. Jones. Um, <laughs> listening to Leah describe uh, Gaza, it's, 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 and listening to you ask the questions, the, the extent to which the Israeli public just is shut down to that reality and doesn't understand the way in which we are um, implicated in it pr presently and in the past um, is something that we, for the most part, can only just scratch our heads at and, and, and bewilderment. And I think that one of the reasons that the film um, is gaining the popularity that it has is because Leah represents a conscious, eyes wide open, ears wide open, active, wanting to do something person. Um, and she never left the country, although she could have, like many other people. She never um, gave up, as uh, other professionals uh, sharing, you know, the work that she does did. Um, uh, something in that um, dogged tenacity um, and insistence on continuing to sometimes, unfortunately, say the exact same thing, um, not only year in and year out, but decade in and decade out, um, is inspiring to people, and people are taking taking notice. You know, Leah often says to the audiences when we go to festivals around the world, um, um, Take what you saw and, and, and speak about it and act on it. And I often say something slightly different, not that I disagree with her. I say, take what you saw and look at this exact, um, these cases and the roles that the various people in the film play and look at your own society. Who are you in this story in your own society? Be it Hungary, be it Brazil, be it the United States, be it Russia, be it Turkey, be it all of the places that are part of that tidal wave of moving uh, further to the right and eroding basic, basic notions of civil rights and civil liberties. Um, I think that this film uh, is very much about Israel-Palestine, obviously, but it's, um, it goes way beyond that, and we have lessons to draw from it. Um, and finally, Leah Semel, yourself, yeah. um, what do you see as a solution to the situation in Israel-Palestine, and what gives you hope? It's very say it's very difficult to say what I see as a solution. I what whatever they will achieve that brings about honor, equality to the, the both people. I will take as a solution. What do I hope? As she said, I did represent those who are now grandfathers and later the sons that are fathers. And already I did represent the third generation, the grandchildren of those people in a chain. I don't want to represent the grand grandchildren, child. I don't want. That's it. I think it's time for a solution. And it depends so much on also your audience, on the Americans, on others. So I hope it will bring them to do something also from their point. And your view of yourself uh, as an Israeli lawyer, um, a Sabra, a person who was born in Israel, mm -hmm. what that means? It means, you know, I did what I could do. And I still keep doing it, and I hope others will not have to do it again and again. Uh, I think I did the right thing, and uh, I have no regret. And if I have to start from the beginning, I will.
probably. I want to thank you both so much for being with us. Leah Semmel, Israeli human rights lawyer, Rachel Leah Jones, director of Advocate, the new film uh, about Israel Palestine that has just won prize after prize and has just opened the Human Rights Watch Film Festival here in New York. This is Democracy Now! To see part one of our discussion, go to democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.